Okay. Um, welcome everyone to a new episode of Pada Spotlight. Um, good morning from Bangkok or good evening or good afternoon wherever you are based. Uh, my name is uh, Rung Tep Gao. I will be your host for today and um, we will be or we are partnering with Plastic Free Southeast Asia with the wonderful Sarah Rhodes for this webinar. Um, so let me tell you a bit more about Pada Spotlight in general. Uh, for those of you who might have joined or for yeah who joined this uh, webinar for the first time. So Pada Spotlight is a new webinar series that we launched this year and we are working with Pada members to um, give different like insights into different topics um, so our wonderful members are sharing their expertise in different fields with um, fellow PADA members and whoever is interested in it. So today we're focusing on um, plastic, um, how to reduce plastic. And the topic of today is five key ingredients to reducing plastic. Um, here at PADA, we always support sustainability. Um, it's one of our missions to, to make the industry um, more sustainable or support uh, sustainable development in the industry. So we're super excited um, to again partner with Sarah Rhodes from Plastic Free Southeast Asia and have her give us some more insight of how we can start uh, what are the little things, uh, the, the first steps that we can do into um, reducing our plastic consumption on a daily basis? And I'm sure she uh, will explain in more detail um, what little easy things you can do. Uh, so, yes, I'm welcoming Sarah here. Um, you can see her. Uh, she will start briefly so let me just give you a quick um, um yeah introduction as i said um, she's the founder of plastic free southeast asia and um she has been living in south southeast asia actually in cambodia for five years and has just recently um moved to uh back up to australia but she will be going back and forth between asia and australia so yes um a warm welcome to Sarah. <laughs> welcome, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thanks everyone who's joined today. This is really exciting. And um, yeah, after living in Cambodia for five years and, uh, you know, really getting, um, excited about seeing the solutions that people are embracing. Like I'm just like, able to share this with, uh, with all of you today. Um, so originally we started as Plastic Free Cambodia in the start of 2015. And this year we expanded to Plastic Free Southeast Asia because we would get a lot of uh, interest from other countries as well. We thought we'd make the name a little bit more user friendly. And uh, even though living in Sydney, in Southeast Asia, it's still, you know, the highest so we like to bridge the gap between Australia and Southeast Asia um, because I think that they're quite connected when it comes to this topic. Okay. Uh, so just um, a little bit about me um, and how Plastic Free started. Um, it was, it was um, I think of it like a Plastic Free July, which is a campaign that started in Australia in 2011. And the Climate Leadership Corps, which was started by former uh, US Vice President Al Gore. I participated in, two of, in both of those things in 2014 and then ended up sort of merging them together and it's just grown and evolved from there. So sharing all of that knowledge and make, uh, simple swaps um, and businesses to reduce their, their plastic footprint 
So my background's actually in tourism and I'm really passionate about sustainability in tourism uh, and then pulling in those like two ideas from some key leaders in the sustainability field was uh, how this all came together. So the way that we approach this is um, we do team building and training workshops uh, and we have worked with a number of different PATA members in the region um, in the hotel sector. Uh, and tourism sector. We also uh, do a lot of advocacy, um, creating awareness and helping people take actions via our social media and online presence. Um, we are consulting and advice, so like real hands-on um, assistance for businesses. The Plastic Free July Challenge is a really core part um, and you know July is a really special time of the year for us to really bring the community uh, into the picture. Um, and we also have like more online programs. So we have an online um, plastic fighters community group, which is really awesome sharing things from like with people all around the world. Uh, and this year we've uh, released our first online course. Um, so that's exciting as well. Um, just making more information more accessible to more people. With the ultimate goal to uh, educate those that don't know enough about the topic, motivate those that know about the topic but don't know how to put it into action so that we can have a, a more beautiful environment in Southeast Asia. And um, we're not the only ones. Uh, it's definitely become a really hot topic. Um, I think more so in the last like 12 to 24 months. Uh, prior to that, I did feel like even though there were a lot of advocates talking about it, um, it seems like everyone's really uh, excited and realises the urgency to do, do something now. And um, this, article, well, this whole magazine from National Geographic last year, they've got a whole online program as well called um, Planet or Plastic. And I like to show this picture because this sort of um, depiction of an iceberg made from a plastic bag is just so accurate with what we're seeing. We're just scratching the surface now. We're just starting to see all of this um, pollution that's underneath the iceberg. I think we realise to an extent, but it's just become so illuminated and visible now. And that was also how I got into this because in Southeast Asia, the use of plastic is so prominent. And I have to say like now being back in Australia, it's really obvious to me now too. So it was also part of my learning journey and I can see like just how much we've adopted it into our daily lifestyles and a lot of it is really unnecessary. So we are really starting to see beneath the surface of that iceberg now. Uh, and we've got some amazing advocates throughout the world and, and David Attenborough is bringing a lot of attention to it now, uh, which is a great way to, to get more eyes onto the topic. And the more we're discussing it, I mean, if you go onto social media, if you go onto the news, there's articles like this, like every day. Um, so it's great because by talking about it, by, um, by illuminating it, we are, we're seeing it and we can do something about it. And that's ultimately what we wanna do is put that knowledge, put that um, motivation into action. So, how much plastic is too much plastic? So I like to just explain um, that from my perspective, what we're mostly talking about is single use plastic. And current 50% of all of the plastic produced is just for uh, single use packaging. Uh, so cups and straws and um, food packaging, mostly of it, most of it is in food packaging. And I'm sure that those of you that are in the uh, tourism industry, in hotels, you will see this as well with how your deliveries are. Um, so it is, um, you know, a really big concern, but we've got other plastics as well. And again, in the tourism industry, the use of plastics for things like airlines has made aircraft lighter, more durable. Uh, it means they're more fuel efficient. So there can be some, you know, some benefits to plastic as well. 
So just to really emphasize that the plastic that we're talking about reducing is really that single use stuff, the kind of plastics that we're using one time and throwing away. Um, so I don't know if any of you have seen um, the survey results. This was done by ACRA Foundation in Cambodia, but we see some very similar trends throughout all of Southeast Asia about how many plastic bags are being used. And so just um, thinking to yourself, or like, you know, feel free to type it in the comments um, for those that are on live, you know, how many plastic bags do you think we use each week? Think of a number in your head um, and think about like your daily routines or what you see with people in the street, people in your community. Um, one uh, of the things that I often ask in live workshops is around this and it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, how people perceive it. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well when we talk about the Plastic Free July a little bit um, further in. But the result was that um, based on the big Cambodian cities, so uh, Siem Reap, uh, Phnom Penh and Sihanoukville, that the average person in Cambodia uses 42 to 52 bags per person per week. Cambodia is a relatively small country compared to some of the others in the region. Well, it's a lot of plastic bags. And based on that number, that's around 2,000 per person per year, which is huge. So, Plastic Free July. So this is where we all, where, where everything sort of began. Um, I ran the Plastic Free July challenge in Cambodia for the first time in 2015. And so, as I mentioned, it's actually a campaign that was started in Australia by a lady named Rebecca uh, back in 2011. Um, and the idea is focusing on reducing your single-use plastic for... Uh, the experts say it takes 30 days to create a new habit and as I like to say July's got 31 days so it means we're going to make some really great habits and the other part of the challenge is when you can't avoid the single-use plastic because nobody's perfect I haven't managed to do a plastic free July in all six times I've done it without getting some plastic along the way but the idea is you keep it. So you start to observe that. So I like this as an exercise that we can do in uh, just observing our own behaviours, our own habits, or like maybe what we find challenging, you know, going to a cafe and saying, can I have a drink with no straw? And then sometimes the staff will still give you a straw. So learning about those things and how we can come up with different techniques to avoid them in the future. But when we throw the plastic away straight away, we forget it. It's very out of sight, out of mind. So that's what part of the challenge is about, is keeping it at the forefront and having a look at it and seeing like how we can then address it and make it better. Um, so just a dot points here, feel free to take a screen capture or whatever. I'm a big advocate for just doing the best you can. Uh, like I said before, nobody is perfect, but also, um, we find that sometimes it can be really intimidating that it's like if you can't do 100% then a lot of people tend to do 0%. So how can we start to meet in the middle because some action is still better than no action at all. So it's really just about making that promise to do the best you can. Um, and we also start with just five of the most common single-use plastic, so I will talk you through those uh, in a minute. Feel free to have some guesses what you think those plastics are. Um, and being part of a community and doing it as a team, uh, whether you form a green team or you've got an office team or whether you want to join our online community, um, it really helps to have different people to share ideas and techniques with and, you know, how did you do that? And when you go to the local market, like how do you manage to get the lady not to give you a hundred plastic bags when you're buying your fruit and veg? Um, and I think the, the really, the final one is like not to give up, that if you have a bad day, it's okay. Tomorrow is another day and you start afresh and, and put renewed energy into it without hanging on to any, any guilt that you weren't able to, um, you know, perhaps do as good as you would have liked the day before. So there's the sort of the basics. Now, I realise that we're now in December. 
So July is a long way away. I wouldn't want you to feel like you have to wait until July. Feel free to do plastic free January. <laughs> Okay, so these are our five plastic enemies and these are the most common single use plastics uh, pretty much in the world. And by focusing on these five as well, we're also getting really good, uh, good bang for buck in terms of we're reducing a lot of plastic by only focusing on five things. And I think these are a really good place to start to get these going and then once you've mastered these five, you can start to look at other things like additional packaging or um, cutlery, I guess, is another one or other things that you identify in your uh, personal life or in your business life of what you can um, cut back on. So um, these five and if you do uh, have a look at the Plastic Free July website, they've got four and styrofoam is so prevalent in Southeast Asia. I I thought we really need to make it five. <laughs> so it's those styrofoam takeaway boxes, the plastic bags that we're using by the fistful, straws, which most of us don't really need to use at all, but are often just automatically put into a drink, uh, plastic water bottles. And, you know, this one is significant to the tourism industry because a lot of travellers from overseas, and I certainly know from like an Australian audience perspective, a lot of Australians coming over to Southeast Asia will be scared about whether the drinking water is safe. So, you know, we as an industry would need to make them feel safe, make them realise that they can have filtered tap water in a restaurant um, and that it's perfectly safe and that, you know, the region has... Um, has evolved and actually some of the countries that they say Cambodia in fact has some of the cleanest tap water in the whole region it's just that the infrastructure is a little bit dodgy so like it's still sensible to filter it and actually I just posted on our Instagram and Facebook uh, stories yesterday about like different options for filtering water to have safe drinking water without the plastic bottles uh, and plastic cups so I mean fruit shakes have always been uh, super popular in the region and I have seen like over the last five years just the coffee culture explode so there's like coffee stands everywhere and every coffee cup you're getting a cup a lid a straw plastic bag so you can hang it on your handlebar um, you know so that's you know even just alleviating coffee cups would reduce like four pieces of plastic per serve and um, Okay, so we've identified our enemies, uh, but we can also uh, replace them with alternatives or, or nothing or minimise them. I'm all for minimising first and then replacing second. But we do have comparatively uh, five reusable friends. Uh, so having a lunchbox or food containers um, or tiffin, um, Tiffin, stack Tiffin carriers, and I've seen some great hotels actually implement this to use for like tour. There is a day, or they're doing a breakfast or a sunset tour. Packing the food into Tiffin carriers, um, especially for tourists, is so cute and so novel, and that like gonna love that and talk about that so much more than they would if they just got a, a styrofoam container and some crappy plastic cutlery. Um, reusable bags, so again, like hotels have changed and like using like local textiles, local woven baskets, like things that are culturally on brand. Uh, again, a really nice thing to use to put into guest rooms or uh, offer them for, you know, taking their wet swimmers back from the pool or things like that without having to use plastic bags. Um, Bamboo straws are massively popular now and they look really fantastic, but also uh, some places are getting really innovative and using different kind of plant straws or lemongrass or something that like matches with the welcome drink uh, or just no straw at all. So there's something that we can, we can minimise a lot of. And then uh, reusable water bottles. So we talked about that making people feel safe and assured that the water is fine to drink uh, and giving them easy options to refill. 
uh, offering that as a service, putting refill water stations in easy places for people to be able to, to fill up their bottle themselves without feeling awkward. And that's something that I've had feedback on that people feel maybe sometimes a bit shy to ask. Uh, because, you know, sometimes there is the perception, it's like, oh, you don't want to pay for water. It's like, well, actually, I just don't want to create the plastic waste. So if it's done in a way that's like very open and welcoming, um, then people will take it up and, and feel happy to do it and not feel shy um, about refilling their bottle. And reusable cups. Um, so again, like if it's like uh, tour excursions, um, being able to provide your guests with a reusable cup for coffee or drinks or, uh, or even water. I mean, back to the water bottles, there's like some great branding opportunities there as well. Um, but it also can become, you know, a souvenir for guests to take home. Uh, but just like those little touches, I think also add a lot of class, a lot of elegance and make people feel a lot more special. And um, I mean, that's really, what we're aiming to do. The whole uh, tourism sector is about leaving people with these experiences and feelings that make them want to come back and visit again. And some of those smaller touches can be very easy to implement and leave people feeling like a million dollars. So that's really nice. Okay, so uh, just getting some backup now from, uh, from the UN, this great little video. And uh, I hope it will also help to uh, inspire you to start your plastic free journey. There's something I need to tell you. This relationship isn't working. It isn't good for me. I'm breaking up with you. It's not me, it's you. I became dependent on you. And you were always there for me. Even when I was at my worst. But I didn't realize the damage you were doing. You created a toxic environment. Not just for me. But others too. You are suffocating me. We're just no longer compatible. Also, there's one more thing. I met someone else. I'm respected in public. I'm making friends. I feel like I can breathe again. That's how I deserve to be treated. And it's a healthy relationship. You can find it on YouTube um, if you look up like UN Environment Valentine's Day breakup video, I think it is. Uh, and we've also got some of um, our favorite videos on the um, Plastic Free Southeast Asia website. Um, and I love bringing these kind of things into, into my workshop programs as well. I try and make it a little bit fun. Like it can seem like a serious topic. It can seem really overwhelming, but this video fills me with so much hope, and so I hope that um, hope that you enjoyed it too. Okay, uh, so just to uh, now step through those top five plastic enemies and just talk about some scenarios and where we can uh, start to change those. So, um, the first one we're looking at is uh, reusable bags or like not taking plastic bags. So I've seen. Uh, Hotels, restaurants uh, actually make their own custom size uh, reusable cloth bags, um, take large like plastic um, reusable like Tupperware containers for when they're buying meat or, uh, or seafood. 
um, and having a system in place. And also like a lot of uh, restaurants and hotels, if you're getting produce delivered in, just having a conversation with your supplier and seeing if you can get them on board to reduce how much plastic packaging, because often they're coming in big crates anyway. Uh, or even if it's those big foam um, chilling boxes, it doesn't need to be that every single produce is wrapped then in plastic as well. Like often a lot of the, the things can commingle. I often say, yeah, like um, your carrots and your cucumbers, it's okay if they touch, like it's not a big deal. <laughs> Uh, so thinking about some things like that and just having some conversations and I think that you know one of the biggest things is communication and um, having having conversations about it and discussing with guests suppliers uh, your team members uh, about different ideas and it can be quite remarkable the different things that um, teams can come up with once the conversation once the dialogue is open and uh, number two is about coffee cups. So as we discussed, like it's it's become like a daily ritual for most people who think it's a necessity. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's a it's a luxury. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the the tips that I like to share. The way I taught myself um, to avoid plastic takeaway coffee cups was simply by denying myself the opportunity to have a coffee if I didn't have my reusable cup. And I can tell you, I don't ever forget my cup anymore. Like a couple of times going without and it's like, okay, I really want that coffee. So I'm going to have to remember to take my cup. Um, dining in is another option. So we're in this life moment where everything is so busy all the time. And I get a little bit fatigued by that. Oh, I'm just so busy. I need to take away. I'm just so busy. So, okay, I think that we can take a deep breath. Let's um, look after our well-being as well. And sitting in a cafe for five minutes isn't going to derail an entire uh, day's worth of work. And then the picture on the um, screen, I'm presuming you're seeing this the same way I am, is a thermos. Uh, and this was um, implemented at the Inley Princess Hotel in Myanmar, where they would give the thermos to their guests. So going on day excursions, they want to take coffee. You want a coffee? Okay, we'll make you a coffee. We'll give it to you in the thermos. Bring the thermos back when you're done. Um, so a really nice way of, of getting around that so that people can still have that little luxury, that little um, hit of coffee, caffeine, comfort, whatever you want to call it in the morning uh, without creating the excess waste. Straws. So if we think about reducing firstly i've seen some amazing restaurants that have simply just gone from automatically putting the straw in a drink to only on demand and a lot of places that only provide straws on demand they end up only putting a straw in things like a fresh coconut like people actually don't need straws i have this theory that we're like sort of like a bell curve that most people um, in the middle of the bell don't mind either way. If there's a straw, they'll use a straw. If there's not a straw, they won't use a straw. They're not bothered. And then the two ends, you've got the people that are like, I must have a straw, like now or two. And then there's the people at the other end of the bell curve, which are like my kind of people, which are like, I definitely do not want a straw. Don't you put that straw anywhere near my drink. So, you know, I think that there's something we can do there in terms of not assuming what our customers want and if they want it providing it for them but again it comes back to communication and just having that conversation around it uh, and also many of those places that have stopped automatically putting straws are using an alternative like bamboo or metal or glass there's like so many very cool options available now even silicon which can be good for uh, bubble tea if uh, if anyone's a bubble tea fan um, so just, just thinking a little bit more about that, um, not assuming that, that people want a straw in their drink. And then on the takeaway boxes side of things, so, um, using natural things, using, um, traditional ways of serving, uh, food, or uh, if it's 
takeaway different carriers are like so reusable lunch boxes or I've seen like palm woven boxes for breakfast um, packs and, and all sorts of things that just like they look fabulous they come back reuse them many times and not create a whole bunch of waste and uh, and finally yeah avoiding bottled water so I can still remember when I first went to university back in like 1998, 99. And in Australia back then, that was the first time I ever saw water in a plastic bottle. And I was just like, why? So why would I go out and spend $2 on a bottle of water when I can just get it out of the tap? So strange. Um, you know, but in the very, very short time since then, <laughs> it has escalated. Uh, and in 2016, more than 480 million plastic bottles were produced. Uh, and it's just, it's gone up since then. I don't have a, a more recent stat, unfortunately, but yeah, it's insane. And, um, you know, if we're thinking about tourists that are on a, on a day trip or, you know, spending some time in a country, they might drink between four and six of those bottles every day, especially like Southeast Asia is hot. And for a lot of travellers coming from outside of the region, it's, it's very hot for them. So they're going to drink a lot of water. So it's really great to see like more of these refill programs starting up where travellers can find refill places on a map, an interactive map. They know they can bring a bottle. And again, we need to keep emphasising that message to them that they can bring their own bottle, that the drinking water is filtered and safe uh, and, and making those solutions really accessible for them. Okay, so a couple of uh, takeaways, what um, would be lovely for you to do uh, that I, I hope you will dare to do after today is to take a 30 day challenge. So using that plastic free July guideline that I talked about, just do it for fun, you can start from today. It's early in the morning, so start from today and just see how you go for 30 days. It's a, it's a really interesting experiment. Um, sharing this information, so talking with your colleagues, with your family, uh, on social media, and just seeing you know, what people think about this. So um, sharing something that you've learned and it can help you know, really emphasize that. And the more, like I said, the more we're talking about it, the more, um, action we're going to see as well. Point number three, I, I keep travel responsibly because, you know, tourism is at the foundation of this and this is, you know, sustainability and tourism is where this whole thing began. So whether we're traveling ourselves or whether we're providing the means for other people to travel, doing that responsibly where we're not harming the environment for which actually our industry relies on the environment to attract people to come and visit. Um, it's not impacting negatively on people or the community. Um, you know, this is, this is what the core of it is. And so being a responsible traveler, but then also promoting responsible travel um, solutions for people is uh, really, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, it's really important. And in this day and age, um, more people are looking for that. Travellers want to travel sustainably uh, and consistently in the booking.com surveys that they do every year, consistently they're showing that the vast majority, you know, but I think the last one I saw was two years ago was 87% of travellers and I think that's gone up to like something like 93% of travellers that want to travel sustainably. They want to stay in hotels that are taking care of the environment. So there's a huge demand for it. And we, in, as the industry, we as the ones that are living in the country and know the solutions, we need to be able to make those solutions easy for people because often, you know, they're there for a very short amount of time and they don't have the time on the ground to find the solutions themselves. Um, use your voice. So point number four uh, is communication. Um, it's just about it's just about conveying our message clearly 
and uh, and more people will understand and um if we just sit in silence nothing will change but if we start to talk about it we you know we're already seeing immense change which is really really positive and finally number five uh forming a green team so uh one of my favorite sayings is it's more fun with a friend like everything is more fun in a community or with a friend so whether that's a workplace community um whether you want to join our online community um doing it uh, in a team is uh, a lot more fun we get a lot more ideas motivation and, and also be held a little bit accountable for putting some changes into place okay so i just want to leave you with a couple of slides uh pictures photographs from around the region and you know really the reasons why we're doing this and how we can do it so the ultimate goal is to protect nature this is our home we rely on this. This is everything. Uh, if we protect the environment, then, then everything else is um, easier after that. And, you know, let's stay with that <laughs> as, a, as a light message. Like everything is easier if we take care of the environment first and foremost. Uh, we can educate others. So again, sharing the information, you know, hop, hop onto our website. There's, there's videos there that we use. I'm happy for you to take them and share them if you find them uh, interesting and um, motivating to, to other people as well. Getting involved says government programs as well. We're seeing more and more government announcements about banning plastics, about different initiatives. So like, can you get involved in that? Because strength in numbers, the more we support those kind of actions, the more those governments are going to do those kind of things. Influencing your workplace. Uh, things that have struggled to try and go against the flow. And once you get the whole team on board, again, it makes everything so much easier. So influencing your workplace to make more conscious decisions around single-use plastic, uh, reducing that, um, and this example, this photograph is from the Ankle Hospital for Children in Siem Reap. There's also an Ankle Hospital for Children in Loain Bay. They've got a couple of real eco champions and they've done staff training for all of the staff, which is in the um, over a hundred, I think, at that location. And I love this example because if anybody had a leave pass for not reducing plastic, it would be a hospital. You know what? There's plastics outside of the medical care, the hygiene stuff that we can get. And they recently told me that they'd gotten rid of something like 30,000 plastic bags, single-use plastic bags out of use that they were buying. I think on a month, I don't know if it was a monthly basis or if it was a few months worth, but they just stopped altogether, which is phenomenal. Uh, community events, there are events usually centred around um, programs like Trash Hero, prevalent in the region, and it's a really good community action. Uh, again, as we work, being involved in them. Um, hotels often get involved in these kind of programs. So, like, if you are a hotelier, this can be something really... Uh, nice to also build your own team, but also to be able to interact with other businesses in your area and make it like a, a fun and exciting activity. Uh, but it also brings awareness to the plus. Again, we can start to about reducing and, and getting rid of this plus. Uh, solution. It's very easy for us to sit back and go, oh, it's very bad, it's terrible. Um, but every time we make the single stick, then we're being part of solving the bigger problem and it's going to happen step by step. So, uh, we're coming to the end of the formal presentation. Um, but if you are interested in uh, more information like this and tips, uh, we do have a um, regular news and information that we share. We've also got a special festive season bonus at the moment. Um, when you signed up,
for the webinar, if you've given Pata permission, they will give me your email address and they can sign you up automatically. Otherwise, you can go to the website um, and I've got the link for you in a bit, plasticfreesea.co, uh, and add your name you'll get those uh, top 10 tips for the festive season straight away and also uh, be able to maintain contact with us and hopefully be inspired on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, was it the first one? Um, is there any specific reason why you chose July as the month for the Plastic Cruise Challenge? Okay, great, cool. Uh, so um, Rebecca, who founded the Plastic Free July Challenge, she chose July and I, just knew that. <laughs> um, and she chose July for no other reason than that that's when June 2000, how much plastic she was using, she started talking to her colleagues. She was working in a local council at the time. She started talking to her colleagues and a whole bunch of her colleagues said, well, yeah, well, why don't we all just try and do plastic free for a month? So they did and that month happened to be July. Um, now, I mean, it's impressive, firstly, like all of her action is online and accessible and she encourages people to you know, download the graphics and, and use that. Uh, but also it's grown to over 3 million participants uh, as of last year, uh, all around the world, which is just phenomenal. Yeah. So that's why July. <laughs> So there's a couple of comments here. Uh, I don't think using bamboo straws is a good idea. It would be better if we don't use any straw. And what do I think? Um, I think using no straws is is absolutely like the first option we should go for. Uh, the less we can use, the better. Like we are using so many resources uh, so frivolously, um, and with the amount of people. Uh, you know, more than 7 billion people living on the planet. But, you know, there are, there are occasions where people do want to have a straw and this is certainly a challenge in the service industry uh, where obviously we want to be able to provide excellent service. Um, a lot of the time, again, it, it's like that bell curve I talked about. I don't think most people mind. So a lot of the time, if you just said, oh, okay, we're trying to protect the environment. Uh, we don't have straws. Most people will be okay. Um, but what I do hear from time to time around bamboo straws is some people don't think that they are hygienic, uh, which is interesting because uh, if anybody you know, knows about bamboo, bamboo is actually a naturally antiseptic uh, wood. Um, but it does mean it needs to be cleaned. However, if you're in like a service, like an industry, like a restaurant or whatever, you're normally washing cutlery, like knives and forks and spoons anyway. So um, surely you can also wash a straw. Uh, but based on that, some people prefer the stainless steel straws. Um, but there are more and more uh, alternatives that are single use. Um, coming onto the market as well, like grass or wheat or uh, tapioca. Um, so again, I think like our first option absolutely should be just like no straw at all. And then finding if you do need to serve an audience that may from time to time need straws, what's the best option that you can use as an alternative that's available on request only. Um, could we reach out to someone specifically for hotels, especially treating water to make it drinkable? And also, how can we better influence vendors and suppliers? Yes, okay. Um, in, in India specifically, I'm not sure, but I would have a look uh, firstly at any uh, water NGOs. Uh, sometimes water NGOs also offer um, corporate uh, options as well, like so corporate filters that you can buy from them, are they testing to test the quality of water or even the quality of filters that you've got. Um, there are so many different filters um, that are accessible. So biosand filters are uh, a really great option, uh, but if you want something, there are systems that can be plumbed into, uh, into your hotel so that you can have filtered water from your taps. 
so I would just uh, have a bit of a scissor out there uh, and um, you know provide that service for you. And how can we better influence vendors and suppliers? Uh, one of the things that I often recommend is um, you know, just holding, eating, having a conversation with them. You're doing you know, a small presentation about the goals of your hotel uh, and why environment's important to you and getting them on board. I think that if they're on board and they feel involved in helping to provide solutions, uh, then they're committed to actually delivering that and, and having a strong partnership with you. So uh, that's certainly something that I, I would recommend. And then just um, repetition, continuing that conversation and reminders or discussions to find solutions. Yeah. Okay. So I can just go down the list. How are we going for time? So, um, how about facilities to wash reusable cups and straws that travellers are using? And um, yeah, is there the next step beyond providing these for travellers? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of travellers are in fact um, bringing their own stuff, and and they'll wash it themselves. Um, but I think that could be a great idea. Again, like making it uh, like, okay, you're welcome to use your own reusable containers or cups or whatever. Um, feel free to use this sink to clean up. I mean, lots of restaurants where, you know, when you with your hands, for example, open towels. So like I can, I can pictures. We're just making it an offer, make it part of the staff service dialogue. So sometimes when I go to get a coffee, I will maybe be my second coffee of the day, and I'll just I will ask because I'm you know bold like that. I will ask um, for them to wash my cup. But I have seen it the other way around where people are like, oh, would you like us to wash that? It's really nice, and it makes it feel again less intimidating for those travellers. Uh, that are trying to do the right thing. Uh, so the next question down from that, is it possible to have your presentation today to distribute within our compass? Rung is going to send that out to you afterwards. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, yes, I will provide my email address at the end and uh, very happy for you to contact me with any other questions uh, or anything you want to discuss. Um, next question down. Um, good morning, Sarah. First of all, thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, starting is the most important part. So true. Uh, and how to get rid of starting problem. Yes, we know we're damaging the environment, but somewhere and something stopping is not to fight against these issues. How to start is still my question. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally get this question. Um, I think it comes back to that uh, kind of all or nothing thing to a degree. Sometimes it can feel like, well, I can't be like those zero waste bloggers and I can't be completely plastic free. So it's hard to start which is why starting by doing one thing, uh, once you get going, it's like going to the gym. It's like, oh, I don't wanna to go to the gym or I don't wanna go exercise because it feels hard and it's early or I just finished work and I'm tired. Um, but as soon as you go, it feels good. Um, and the other part of it is, is that when the majority of our colleagues and friends and family are doing one thing, it's really difficult to go in a different direction. And so I would encourage you to you know, follow us on social media and um, just start things like you don't have to, you know, do the whole thing, like be plastic free by the end of today. <laughs> um, that would be, that would be difficult. But even if you start with one thing, like getting a reusable coffee cup or only having coffee at your office or your home um, or whatever it is that resonates with you, Thing that you can change, just go for it and see how it goes. Just test it. Down is 
between plastic refillable bottle and silicon refillable bottle, which one is better for environment? Um, great question and something that I'm, I'm still sort of digging around on because um, there's a lot of different information about silicon uh, and to me, it's not entirely clear. Um, a lot of places are selling silicon as a better option, a safer option, uh, because it's um, made primarily from silica, um, which is naturally occurring. But then there's other, other reports that say it, is de it isn't great to use because of uh, resources and other things. So I would need to hear around a little bit more than that. The thing with plastic is that um, plastic refillable bottle is back to the iceberg that even though we're seeing things like BPA free uh, or like food grade plastic when now there's so many other chemicals in the plastic as well is it will never ever break down so if it's not recycled or recyclable it won't be so my advice when it comes to refillable water bottles is two best for health and hygiene are actually like food grade stainless steel or glass and glass in particular is infinitely recyclable. So probably lean, lean more towards one of those two options. Um, and yeah, happy to look into some more of the, the pros and cons against silicon down the track. Okay, four new messages. <clears throat> Planning on making leaf plates in Nepal and sell it to the restaurants, making leaf plates in the traditional way and making sure we can teach this technique to people of Southeast Asia. That's amazing. That's a really great idea. Um, love that a lot. We, I, we see this a lot on the internet uh, and I haven't seen anywhere that it's accessible. So um, yeah, great idea. That's awesome. Okay, uh, that's all the questions I can see. Have I got them all? Yep. Great. Uh, sorry about the tech issues there. So just to uh, provide you with my contact details. Uh, so anything about this presentation or information about Plastic Free, uh, we've got a website there, plasticfreesea.co, uh, my email address, um, Plastic Free Southeast Asia on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so feel free to connect. And then if anything to do with Pata, uh, you can contact Pata and Rung and her team uh, on the email address membership at pata.org. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? I can. Yay! <laughs> okay, so sorry, um, we're facing these issues. So yes, thank you so much for answering the questions and My for pleasure. giving the presentation. I hope for everyone who uh, was listening live that it helped you, it motivated you to start uh, reducing plastics in your daily life. Um, so yes, we are at the end of this webinar and. Um, Email us, email Sarah, if you want any more information. We are sharing the presentation with all the PADA members by email, but we'll also send the recording to everyone who has registered for this webinar. And um, Sarah has also a course coming up. So I just want to um, give that out to everyone who has listened. If you think this was interesting for you and you would like to uh, get more information and even more detailed, like more in-depth information on how to continue on this journey. Um, I believe the course is starting next Monday um, and she can send you more information on that. So if you're interested in learning more about the course, uh, please feel free to reach out to Sarah. Um, you have her email, you know how to reach out to her. Sarah, do you want to maybe give your email one, one more time for people who would like yeah. to? Yeah. 
Sure, I'll just, um, I can go back to the screen. So it's Sarah at plasticfreesea.co. Uh, the course is online. It starts on Monday, but our registrations are closing on Saturday. So um, yeah, do drop me a line if you want to talk about that more. And there's information on our website as well. Yes. So I think it's, it's a great way to um, educate yourself even more if you want, because you, as, as Sarah just mentioned, it's, a, it's an online course. You can do it from everywhere. Um, you're flexible with your hours, I believe, um, when you want to do the course. Uh, there will yeah. be some live question and answer classes included as well. So that's the time when you might have to like schedule time a bit. But yeah, um, maybe you want to look into this uh, and use this chance. So once again, thank you so much, Sarah, for um, giving you, this Ryan. presentation and working with us. And sorry, once again, from our side for the little technical issues. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we wish everyone like a good day, good evening, good afternoon. And uh, we see you at the next uh, spotlight. Yes. So yeah. thank Amazing. you. And bye thank bye. you so much. <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye.